after a short break last week. We are very happy to introduce to you Dr. Tai Tengan from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is an Associate Professor for Ethnic Studies and Anthropology, and his broad interests include ethnic studies, cultural anthropology, indigenous theory and methodology, colonialism, nationalism, identity formation, gender, masculinities, and cultural politics in Hawaii and the Pacific. Today, he will be presenting on towards a Kuleana anthropology, responsibility and relational relationality in Hawaii and Oceania. Um, just a heads up to you, we will be recording this talk, so please make sure to keep your microphones muted. And as for the Q&A, if you want to ask any questions, please send them either via chat or make sure to use the hand raise button that is available. And now, uh, without further ado, I will pass on to Dr. Tengan. The stage is all yours. Thanks, Kim. Um, thank you, Kim, Sultanat, um, Laurie, as well as uh, Dr. Paul Lay and Dr. Helen Alderson for the invitation to come and share and talk story a little bit with you all. I'm really excited to be a part of this series. Um, and the topic of, of decolonizing um, any subfield of, of anthropology um, is near and dear to my heart. I'm a cultural anthropologist um, by training, so it, it might be odd that, that I'm in this series, but the field school that I'm going to be talking on actually started off as an archeological field school and then became uh, an ethnographic or history one. Um, and, and I'll be talking more to that, um, but one of the first things I, I wanted to do, um, part of the, the cultural protocols that, that we developed um, as part of our own effort to, to not only decolonize the practice of, of archeology, span um, but really to, to root it, to ground it in, in Hawaiian ways of thinking and being, um, to allow for Hawaiian forms of life to resurge through, through our voice and through the, the intention that we put into the work when we're on the land. Um, and it, it involves a chant, uh, a chant that asks for permission to enter uh, the space. Um, and typically we would offer this um, prior to conducting any of the work that we're doing in the field. Um, I, I still use this even when we're not in the field, even in this time of COVID, when I'm having to teach our field school virtually on Zoom. Um, it, it's a way of, of helping to focus our intentions to, to the aina, to the land, and to those kupuna. Um, and I want to offer it here um, as we're going to go into this space and, and also offer it as, as my own uh, asking for permission to, to speak on, on uh, the stories of this land and, and these elders. Um, I'll get back to that melee, that chant a little bit later, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of where we're going. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about Kuleana, this, this Hawaiian concept, which we can, as a shorthand, refer to as responsibilities. Um, I like to refer to it as relational responsibilities um, and how that figures into a kind of practice um, that helps center Indigenous Hawaiian as well as other Native Pacific ways of being. Um, and then to think about that in relation to anthropology, uh, both archaeology and cultural or social anthropology. Um, to foreground aina, that's our concept for the land, which in Hawaiian language also implies people on the land. 
as opposed to lands that do not have people on them. So it's both land and people, lived environments and living environments. Um, and to, to relate that to kanata, to again, that's our term for people. Um, usually with a capital K, it's also about native Hawaiians. And this becomes a shorthand for other ways of referring to Hawaiians, kanaka Maori, kanaka oivi, uh, but can also be broadly inclusive of, of people. And then to think about the ways in which uh, the field schools, and I have plural because the first phase was archeological, the second phase became ethnographic oral history, um, seek to, to fulfill certain kuleana and, and also open up new ones. Um, and Kim or, or Sultanat, feel free to give me the, 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 the timer if, if yeah, I'm starting to go over um, and that'll help me keep uh, my pace. So really everything I wanna present is the culmination of, of nine years of, of field school on the North shore of Oahu um, in the, the Moku, the district of Waialua. Um, it uh, started off um, as an archeological methods training program that was sponsored by Kamehameha Schools. Kamehameha Schools is a private institution uh, for native Hawaiians. Um, it also is the largest private land owner, having received its lands from uh, the Kamehameha dynasty um, that um, held the bulk of the lands during the time of the, the Hawaiian kingdom in, in the 19th century. And um, today those lands um, and other investments go to support three private schools for native Hawaiians um, K through 12, as well as a number of uh, different preschools and other educational opportunities. Um, the um, field school uh, started primarily as a partnership with Kamehameha schools as they were seeking to um, unveil a new plan for some uh, 28,000 acres of, of land that they hold on the North Shore. And part of that, it, it was a really complex set of uh, developments that they're proposing, including windmills and new, new subdivisions and new agricultural ventures. But one of the components was a, a, an archeological field school to help steward their wahikupuna, their um, ancestral places. And so that's how we got involved. And I'll get to that also a little bit, but I want to acknowledge all of the, the students, all of uh, my co-instructors, in particular, Jim Bayman. He's kind of in the back with the green hat on the, on the far left. Um, he was really the, the primary director of the archeological uh, component that went from 2013 until 2017. Um, and we have a number of others who are involved with um, teaching and serving as graduate assistants um, over the years. Um, this is uh, 2018 and we kind of had that shift to the oral history field school, which really built upon many of the relationships that we formed as part of the archeological field school. And, and I'll return to that. Uh, but this is also, especially when we uh, strengthened our connection uh, and partnership with the Waialua Hawaiian Civic Club, which is a a mutual beneficial society. Um, there's a number of these civic clubs throughout the islands. Um, and this one really is an important center for native Hawaiian activity um, in a community that um, has seen a lot of change over the years. Um, as some of you might know, sugar was king, as they say, sometimes in Hawaii um, and no more so than in Waialua on the North shore. Um, the, the economy really was, was dominated um, by sugar from the late 1800s up until the, the, the last plantation um, finally shut down um, on the North Shore in, in 1996. And that's the, the point where there's um, been a lot of change pretty quickly in terms of the community. I mean, change was already happening. There was already tourism that was increasing and most people know the, know the North Shore for surf um, because of the industry that's built up there. Um, but really after the plantation closed and economic opportunities really shifted, 
um, so did the community. And there was a deep sense that people were losing their history. They're losing the connections that made their community uh, Waialua. And, and that, that's really the time that we wanted to focus on, on recording some of these stories and helping to um, support the community's efforts to, as they say, keep the country country. Um, that was also part of the endeavor with the archaeological field school too. But this one was really much more in the community working with the, the folks. Um, we had this for three years, 18, 19, 20, and bam, COVID hit. Um, and so we're still going, but we're going now in Zoom. We're unfortunately no longer out in Waialua. We hope to return after things are safe, but most of what I'm gonna present on are, are sort of the beginnings of both the archeological field school and the oral history field school. Um, and why? why, why, why Kuleana? Why is that important? Um, well, just to bring in um, one of my favorite writers about decolonizing anthropology, uh, Dr. Faye Harrison, um, in, in their really critical and important volume, Decolonizing Anthropology, first published 1991 and then republished twice more. Um, you know, she issues this call in her introduction uh, to challenge anthropologists to take more seriously the critiques, constructions, and theoretical deliberations of scholars belonging to neglected, peripheralized, or erased traditions that have long confronted and challenged colonial, neo-colonial structures of power and economic relations. Major impetus for transformation and for theorizing about it must come out of the experiences and struggles of third world peoples in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and the quote belly of the beast, namely the internal colonies within the so-called first world. And it's, it's with that, um, heeding that call that I wanna offer at least one of the concepts that has become really prominent within Native Hawaiian, not only research paradigms, but really political, spiritual, cultural projects of resurgence, and, and that's Kuleana. So, um, just a few of, of the, the meanings of Kuleana um, that, that I'll point to here. And I'm now realizing that my screen is not showing everything. And I'm going <laughs> to, I hate when this happens with Zoom. Um, so, the, some of the core definitions that, that I've underlined here are the ones that I think I, I'm, I'm most looking to inform uh, the kind of project that I want to articulate here. Um, typically people say kuleana is responsibility and that's correct, uh, but it also has this aspect of right, of privilege, of authority, of reason and cause. And it also during the Hawaiian kingdom period took on a, a more focused definition around private property and land as it was being allotted to commoners in particular and they're able to make claims to these kuleana lands based on those relationships of, of having lived there for generations and worked on them and grown food on them and, and so forth. Kuleana also has this other meaning of a blood relative through whom one traces a relationship as to an in-law. Um, so this deeply relational and land-based sense of kuleana points to, as a number of Hawaiian scholars have, have noted, um, deeper epistemological underpinnings of what it means to be in relationship and in good relationship to the land and to others and how that is rooted in particular cosmologies of the, the, the creation of, of the world and our place within it and how we are supposed to act to keep things in the proper balance. And there's been a, a lot written and I'm not gonna to go too much into that, but I'll just note that, that that's become one of the key ways of, of organizing not only research, but also claims in terms of protecting lands that are threatened by development, um, also protecting knowledge um, and particularly knowledge that is 
um, at risk of, of being taken, commoditized, um, and erased. So this, this aspect, again, about understanding responsibility and 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 through relations is, is really critical. And I like this image here, and it's part of one of our, our field school um, workshops where we were learning how to make lei, um, the, the garland that one wears that I'm wearing right now. That's not the lei that we're learning how to make here. Um, Moki Labra, who is also in the opening image and who led this workshop is, is a master lei maker. And he was teaching us how to make a simple tea leaf Play, which is essentially a way of creating cordage. Um, it's, it's the same technique you would use to make cordage, except you're using the, the tea leaf, um, a Hawaiian leaf. Um, and there's a few different techniques, but I, I like this image in particular because it shows the connection with the cord. And cordage has become a really powerful way of understanding Hawaiian concepts uh, of, of binding and being in relation with others, with the land, in particular with this aspect of the land that comes to connect people pretty literally in, in this sense, but also spiritually and otherwise. It's why we wear these lays such as the one that I have now uh, to reaffirm those connections and also, again, the responsibilities that come with them with the gift. This is, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on here, but there has been some important thinking by my colleague, Noilani Goodyear Kaupua, who is in political science, on thinking about the, the creation of these ropes, in this case, ropes of resistance and resurgence um, as part of, of a model for research including lahui, which is peoplehood, ea, which is our term for both sovereignty, but also life and rising, pono, which, which is a, our term for balance, um, also justice, and kuleana, that, that real critical aspect. And, and on kuleana, she, she points to that really as about positionality and obligations, sort of another way of reframing responsibilities and relationality. Um, and, and I won't read this all, but it, it does point to the need to establish long-term kuleana and asking critical questions um, about the ethics of research um, and who benefits from it. How can you create reciprocal relationships in this process? Right? Um, and this, this really has been a powerful way of, of organizing a, a lot of the the research and, and cultural political work that happens on the ground. One example um, is the struggle to stop the construction of a 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea, which is the, the tallest mountain in the world if you measure from the seafloor um, and one of the most sacred summits in our islands and really throughout Oceania and the Pacific. Um, for those not aware, there's been quite a lot of resistance that's been mounted on the, the part of Kanaka of, of Native Hawaiian people, as well as allies um, that, that really came to a fore in the summer of 2019, um, where an, uh, really a whole uh, camp was set up, it's called a Pu'uhonua, um, where the protectors and, and kind of the, there's a resistance to the labeling of being protesters, but the protectors um, create a blockade to stop the construction equipment. Um, some 38 elders were arrested in the process. Um, and it, you know, thousands of people came to this site. And, and really this movement um, based in, in these, these principles that are articulated in the previous slide um, really, really spread throughout the island. So it wasn't just on the, the Mauna, on the mountain where this, this resurgence was happening, but it was all across on the islands um, and including at Manoa where I teach at the University of Hawaii. And it's a, a particularly important site because it's the University of Hawaii that's pushing for the construction of this telescope with its Institute for Astronomy and um, with other aspects of its campuses, um, especially on the big island. So students on, on Manoa 
uh, really moved by Kuleana. Um, th this was a term that came up over and over again. Um, took to the streets, took to the, the president's office. They occupied it for a number of months. Um, faculty who were in support also um, came to, to offer whatever assistance uh, we could, including the, the holding of ceremony um, on campus. Um, and, and all of this was, was a really powerful critique as well on the ways in which the university, despite it touting itself to be indigenous serving, a Hawaiian place of learning really has failed in, the, in this regard. Um, of course, COVID brought that to an end too, unfortunately, but people still actually are going up to the Mauna. Um, in the meantime, um, while things are sort of, um, you know, cooled down a little bit with the Mauna, Manoa, our, our university has also come out with its new strategic plan, um, which has foregrounded Kuleana in ways that have, have troubled some, um, as it, there's a sense that now perhaps U, UH Manoa is, is trying to kind of repurpose Kuleana for its own means. Um, at the same time, there are uh, some really important Native Hawaiian thinkers who have spent a lot of energy trying to get the university to move in that direction. So a lot of actually what's articulated in this plan come from Native Hawaiian scholars who um, have taken this opportunity in part because of the heavy critique that Manoa's had because of Mauna Kea to really refocus on Kuleana specifically in relation to Aloha Aina, this aspect of, of not only love as people commonly translate aloha, but uh, being in good relation, this compassion and, and having these deep connections to the land and the people. And, and uh, that becomes an uh, organizing way of, of looking at things. So how about Kuleana at Cambridge? Well, I'm not there, but I was there once. So I'm just gonna throw this in here just for the heck of it. I'll pretend I'm there, but what does the discussion of Kuleana have to do with anything at Cambridge? Well, if you're having the discussion on decolonizing archaeology, then it connects. And um, in other ways as well that I would offer um, here at Manoa, uh, one of the, the things that we really took to was thinking critically about Kuleana in relation to the Mauna became this really important uh, part, point for self-reflection. Uh, we actually organized students to go to the Mauna um, and, and have also, um, as I'm gonna point to pretty soon, uh, taken up Kuleana really as an organizing theme uh, for the department. And this came really largely from uh, former chair, Christine Yano, who during her time as chair really tried to articulate that as a vision and really in helping to put together the applied uh, cultural ME that both of us are helping to co-direct uh, articulated Kuleana anthropology as, as really critical. But Kuleana to do what is sort of the question. And, and a lot of this has really helped reground us in protecting sacred places and the communities from harm, particularly by the university. Anthropology was not so tied up in this project, but it was a little bit. Um, in some of the trials in the 30 meter telescope, uh, an archeologist was brought in to say that certain sites would not be impacted by the development. Other archeologists contested that. Um, so again, these, these points in which archeology span come to matter um, happening again here. I was um, asked a little bit briefly about these other broader issues of repatriation and burial, knowing that Cambridge recently repatriated a number of, of Hawaiian EV um, bones back. Burials became a real critical issue too, along with so many other issues that are really signaling the, 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 the collective efforts of Hawaiians to reclaim Kuleana in all aspects of their, their history and their future. Um, but who's Kuleana in terms of anthropology anywhere? Um, and, and here I want to uh, reference the, the work um, of Leona Chua and Monica Mather, who were the ones who invited me to Cambridge the other time. And I was very happy to participate um, in the, the workshop 
um, asking who are we, right? Uh, what are we talking about when we say we? That's kind of important if we're going to talk about who's got what kuleana, in part because kuleana is also about knowing what is not your responsibility, right? Um, so it's important to not uh, overly romanticize and, and generalize saying everyone has the same kuleana, um, especially when you have such uh, heterogeneous um, and oftentimes occluded set of distinctions within the field. Um, and so the, really this is the point that they raise by foregrounding the relational entanglements that anthropology is a part of. It helps to decenter the kind of generic notion of the anthropologist field worker and helps us to reimagine what anthropology could be. Um, and really it's about reaching out and uh, really connecting in other ways and opening oneself and the field um, to those other relations. And, and again, I think this is really important and, and noting that anthropology as this unfinished project uh, requires that open-endedness. It's, it's a point that I also found resonance with um, in Amy Meredith Cox's piece um, afterward on why anthropology as a part of the hotspots um, in cultural anthropology blog that was in response to the, the How Journal fiasco. <laughs> um, and what she notes is that this unconditional relationality um, is one where relationships um, that are formed are not just about the anthropological project, but really it's about learning others and how those realizations of real deep understanding can help create new solutions to living in this uh, increasingly crazier world that we're in. This unconditional relationality is also rooted in the sense of responsibility and accountability to others. And I would add here too also, especially to the land. And this is where I'm gonna kind of start moving back to Hawaii and then to the field school. First by noting that one of the, the key works in terms of Hawaiian archeology span Again, I'm not the archaeologist, but I would point to one work that is really critical is uh, Kathleen Cavello's Kuleana and Commitment, which again, she foregrounds the project of not only transforming Hawaiian archaeology, but more meaningfully involving Hawaiians in the project through understanding Kuleana and, and through the relationships that come from it. Um, and th this is really part of her core project. She's at UH Hilo where they've developed this really important heritage management program um, that uh, has, has been doing great work. And I won't read this quote, but that's the, the gist of that. Another organization um, made up not only of archeologists, but also other uh, professionals in cultural resource management um, led all by native Hawaiians is called Huli Awapa'a where if you look at the very bottom of, of their statement of who they are, it is again about elevating kuleana and understanding these contexts of work and the responsibility to care for sacred sites, malama, sacred sites is, is what that's referencing. And, and these are some of the folks involved in this broader collective that Huliawa Pa has brought together. And again, it's reaching out side of anthropology to those others who are either land owners or developers or in government um, that really we've seen some really important progress. Much of this reaching out has also been to our, our cousins in and across the Pacific, in particular in Aotearoa and Australia. Um, and this, this work really has, has been powerful and important. And it's helped to also frame our project of applied anthropology. Um, and again, we have two programs at Manoa. One is archaeology, one is cultural. And it's really in, in the field school that these programs really got to take hold and, and gain some traction. So again, this is the, um, for people who wanna see the, the one publication that came out about our field school, um, the archeology span field school, um, this is it. And where we're talking about this pedagogical approach to an indigenous and community-based archeology span in Hawaii. And we, we include in here also our community 
collaborator, uh, Moki Labra, who, who was also in the image I, I showed earlier. And he shared a really powerful story that, that, that stuck with us and helped us think through what Kuleana is. Um, he's an expert lay maker. These are his lays that I'm wearing, including the shell lay. Um, and he shared a story that once he was gathering shells with a friend on the beach, and there was this old one that was a little bit of, a little bit broken, and um, you know his friend was going to leave it, and he said, "Why are you going to leave it? Just because something's old doesn't mean that you just neglect it. You know, there's a responsibility to care for these things that are old, um, even if they look ugly, you know, in your mind." Um, and that became a really powerful lesson as he was connecting that to the work that we were doing when we were first consulting with the community about going to this old place, this old temple site, which is what Kupopolo was, but still very important and still very alive for those connected to it. And this really, um, again, in relation to Kamehameha schools, being part of their efforts to reconnect Hawaiians to these sacred sites um, was part of also, and there's a longer discussion here that I'm not going to get into, but part of their efforts to reorient their organization because it's a multi-billion dollar trust um, that has been sometimes pretty complicit and, and even active in really the, the dispossession of communities when it comes to their land management practices. So there's kind of a lot that was going on with this field school, especially because we we're coming in with Kamehameha schools and this again being the overall plan that we were a part of here. Um, we went to a number of community consultations that both ourselves and Kamehameha schools uh, and their representatives were participating in talking about the field school, but also in relation to their broader plan uh, which, to be honest, we never knew the full extent of, and I still to this day don't ever know the full extent of what chaos is doing because they're just so big. Um, but this was this is the 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 hail the temple site that we are working at um, for three years. It has a, a, an important history in the 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 chiefdom of Oahu um, and in in both the the rise and fall of the last. Um, Oahu born king. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that, but it's just to note that this is a really important um, cultural and ancestral place that people also felt needed to be approached very carefully because it had so much mana and so much spiritual power. In the old days, you know, not everybody could go there. Um, and, and in fact, only men could go there. So, what is it that we're bringing women, we're bringing students, we're bringing all kinds of people into the site. Um, and so that's when we, you know, we, we sought counsel and uh, Moki, who has a deep spiritual connection to the place and is a trained cultural practitioner, gave us these words, um, both about the shell, but also about how to ask permission in the right way. Um, the words that we drew upon came from his his thoughts, as well as an older chant that was recorded um, in one of our epic um, narratives, where the goddess Hi'iaka, upon arriving in this land, offers a chant that has some of the words that I, I used in, in the chant that I gave. Um, and connecting with those histories um, was, was, was important, both for understanding the Hawaiian language aspects, but also those parts that we had to create anew. Um, the featured here is um, Kulama Lima, who is our graduate assistant, who is also Native Hawaiian and um, was one of these young students who went through Kamehameha School's program of, of training Hawaiian archaeologists, but herself also having uh, different traditions and training in her, her background. Um, it was really important to have her because she, she gave us um, direction in, in ways that we didn't expect and, and helped us as, as instructors really open our minds to the really the wisdom of the students as well. So this is us doing the chant that I offered. It becomes uh, an important refrain for asking permission. Um, involving community was, was always critical and, and you see this in quite a lot of the literature on decolonizing archaeology is that community collaboration involvement and really directing 
um, and, and oftentimes the, the the ways in which the work is done. Um, and, and here again is, is Mulkey as well as another community member, Kaipo, who's in the camouflage working with our students. Um, and, and this became really the, the model that we carried out for um, really not only the, the three years we were at Kupopolo, but we eventually also went on to work at a, a different site um, called Uko'a. Um, community engagement days were common where uh, we had uh, people just come and help to take care of the land, also learn archeological techniques. Uh, we went to go visit other cultural sites that were nearby, this one being Waimea Valley, uh, this one being town in, in Haleiwa, um, and really creating a, an opportunity for community and students to come together in ways that uh, had not previously been the case. There was also opportunities for students to organize. There were some really bad bills that were being pushed through the legislature, including this bill that was gonna phase archeological surveys so that you could do one survey for one you know, mile of a project and then wait for the next one. And, and naturally, if you know there are gonna be burials along the way, this is one way of pretty much ensuring that you're gonna hit a burial and then not be able to change the course of that development. So there was a lot of organizing, including by students in our field school. And that was really, I think, an important part of making those connections. I'll just point briefly through the Uko'a section. This is the second area that we're at. Oh, bad image, sorry. Um, and again, more community engagement um, and opportunities for training with students and connecting with community, as shown here, with some of the volunteers having some ava or kava and, and kind of relaxing after the work that they are doing. And also continued visits to other cultural sites. This one being at a fish pond, these massive aquacultural um, projects that are, are really important in Hawaiian food sovereignty and efforts to regain that. Um, this being one of the, the last classes we had at this site before we finally ended up shifting to the oral history component and I would I just know that, you know, the were it not for all these community engagement parts and, and, and activities and visits, um, we would not have had the, the relationships in place to, to proceed with, with the oral history component, with the ethnographic component. Um, those connections became the kuleana, became the ways in which we could connect with others because we, we didn't have that, that, that close connection before we came in. We developed them through, through those relationships that we built um, and through the work. And as people came to know us more and, and also through us connect with these sacred places that they had not yet or hadn't previously connected with, uh, something new came out of that. And um, it really became a fertile ground for for recording oral histories, again, at this time of a lot of change. Um, we had some nice continuity featured here is Malia Evans, who was actually an applied archeology span uh, student who finished with her MA and then she became an instructor for our oral history part because she was already in sort of the applied world doing both archeology span as well as um, oral history. We continue to go back to Kupapolo to honor that, that important site, um, as well as other sites, um, which Kamehameha Schools is also looking to develop deeper connections with uh, community organizations around, this one being Kohoku Velo Velo. Um, but a lot of the work kind of in the second phase was really around training students how to do uh, culturally appropriate, community-based collaborative oral history interviewing. And recording these stories. One of this is within the courthouse, and we have uh, really a, a master interviewer, uh, Kipa Mali, who is working with us. Um, but it's also in line with a vision that the community members, and particularly with the Wailo Hawaiian Civic Club, shared in that they wanted to create a space, preferably here at the courthouse, that would be more of a cultural and heritage center, both to create archives of the community history, um, 
perhaps some spaces for like museum curation of different objects, but, but also a space for really recreating community um, through the stories, through the programs, through cultural events. Uh, one of the, the first elders, Kupuna, that we got to interview was Emmeline Kazi, whose house is right next to the last archaeological uh, field school. And we had already connected with her because we we're doing work right next door. Um, and she had hosted us before, and, and that became a really nice transition um, into hearing her story and, and the history around uh, the, the land that she was on and um, kind of the old buildings. She had this old slaughterhouse, um, she, their ranch, their ranching. And, the ranching wasn't so active at the time that we were there, but um, these great stories came out. Um, another volunteer who had come to our field school when it was an archaeology field school was another person that we interviewed and, and he shared his story of growing up surfing in a spot that came to have his name because uh, he was so renowned as, as a, really a world champion surfer. And all of those stories we would um, transcribe, um, but knowing that people don't want to read 40 pages of transcripts, we had to find a better way of sharing them. And that was done through story maps, uh, these digital stories that take excerpts of the videos as well as images and, and text and make them really accessible. This is Uncle George Ai, who passed away shortly after we did his, his interviews. Um, his family was so moved by the story map that they actually invited us to speak at his funeral. Um, and, and, and that was sort of a testament to the importance of the work beyond just training the students. Um, one of the final things that we do when, when, we're not, when we're not in pandemic situations is to go up into the mountains. Um, and this is like an old kind of Boy Scout campsite that's no longer used for that. Um, but up in Opai Ula, um, and that's where Moki Labra helps to teach us what it is to be in the mountains, what are the right plants to gather for the creation of lay, such as I'm wearing, uh, but also that you're not just there to gather, but you need to give back to the land. Um, so as he's teaching us how to, how to weave, he's also telling us these stories about what you need to replant if you're gonna be taking something. And then what you're gonna do with these lay that you're learning how to make. Um, and again, this being the, the tea leaf and there's a, a kind of method of just doing it on your own with your mouth or also getting support from someone else. And there's always a lesson in the lay making and in the gathering. And then in what you do with the lay afterwards, um, all of these have really important components that are deeply a part of what Kuleana is and has really helped shape what our field school has become and the work that those who, who go through our field school carry on afterwards as a number of them do end up in working with Hawaiian organizations or in the aforementioned Huleawapa'a group that's looking to transform the field or with Kamehameha schools or a number of other places. So these lay um, for our purposes were actually used to the, the gifts that we gave to our, our narrators, the people that we interviewed at the end of the semester. We had a big paina, a big party, where we honored these, these kupuna, these elders. Um, we gifted them with the lei. Uh, we shared their stories with their families. And this became really powerful because many of the families hadn't heard or seen the stories. And this became the first time that they got to hear them as well. And the Kupuna themselves gave back in this auntie, uh, Auntie Kanani, who just loves to sing bra or ukulele and just went to town and really created a very different kind of sense of, of what anthropology and, and really archaeology could be. Um, and importantly, it was again about feeding. Aina, the, the term for land, literally means place that feeds, right? Um, and, and while we were feeding them lunch, um, there is also a deeper kind of feeding of, of, the, of the soul, of, of, the, of the, the mind that was also part of our project. And that's what we look to continue to do um, as long as we can. I did wanna just note 
and recognize some of our other narrators that we had in, in the last couple of years. Um, and um, I think I would end it there. And again, mahalo um, to everyone who let this talk happen. Thank you very much, Dr. Tengan, for that just absolutely fascinating and beautiful talk. And um, we are now opening the Q&A session. And uh, please either raise your hand or um, if you want me to, um, if you want me to uh, just read your question, please just uh, um, send it to, to the chat. Yes, please. Give me a time to get some coffee because yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not yet seven here. <laughs> yeah, I know it is very, very early. Thank you so much for this. But I see some of my, I see some of my whole, some of my friends who are also woke up early for this one. So Mahalo, Ola, Moki, whoever else I'm missing, and to Kathy. <laughs> I see a few of you guys on here. May I then ask you before other people, I think that they are, um, yeah. Um, they have their, I'm sure that they have their questions, but I'm just interested how powerful uh, this term is, yeah, from, from every moment, from for, for, the, uh, for the communities, from the political point of view. How comes that, I'm just interested, how comes that it, it makes such a powerful term that, we, that it just used wide, widely? Can you just explain how? You know, I feel it's it's become more powerful because of the Hawaiian movement and much more explicit assertions of the term kuleana. Although I, beyond even the explicit kind of expression of it, I, I just feel there's also ways in which Hawaiian and local people in general are raised to understand, even if you're not using the term that you know, certain things, you know, that's your responsibility. Certain things are not your responsibility, um, but there is generally a sense, and especially in a place like Waialua, that there, there is a collective responsibility for your neighbors and for keeping the, the, the land clean. Um, you know, one of the things that our, our kupuna have shared over and over again is, is how much of that is lost when people who are not from Wailu are not from Hawaii at all come in and they just don't understand how how to act right and and you know these kupuna said you know when they were young if they were acting up or getting in trouble in in, in you know the, the the next neighborhood when once they got home their parents already knew and <laughs> they just got it because some uncle would call some other auntie and call their parents and, and you know that's how tight the community was and Really, that's really what so many of them have felt is, is, is lost. And I think unfortunately is what has forced many to, to really have to push and explicitly explain what Kuleana is because so many people coming don't have that sense. And that's really the, the situation in Wailua, which is really going under some massive demographic change. Um, and the same goes for cultural sites. Um, and, and what's the responsibility, not only of, of, of newcomers, but even of Hawaiians themselves who become disconnected to these places. A lot of you know, local Hawaiian families, they, they go hunting up in the area and, and that's how they're raised, but they don't necessarily know the history of some of those places, right? So how do you kind of bring them in without you know, trying to be the bad landowner that is now trying to exclude all the, the local people from accessing traditional gathering, right? So there's, yeah, it gets kind of complex there too. Like Kamehameha's Kuleana versus the, the Kupa of Waialua. So there's a whole other thing that is, is, is going on there. Thank you very much, Dr. Tengen. Any questions? Audio, uh, audiences? 
Yeah, please, Paul. Yeah, Ty, thank you very much. That was a really um, fascinating and insightful talk. And you know, to, to my shame, I was really very unfamiliar with, with developments um, and, and the work that um, you and colleagues have been doing on Hawaii. It struck me that Kuliana is offers um, a really powerful and sensible, if, if you like, um, mode of practice, a mode of being and a, a way of um, understanding where individual and group responsibilities lie uh, that is also respectful to tradition and um, different cultural values and so forth. And in my experience, we encounter similar kinds of philosophies and similar kinds of concepts in many other societies and non-Western societies. And a lot of uh, sort of community archaeological engagement and efforts to decolonize archaeology emphasize the value of these within the local context. But it's often that these concepts never quite get the traction that they should have within global practice. And it seems to often the, there is this still this dynamic of indigenous knowledges and indigenous ontologies have only local relevance and resonance, whereas the sort of you know, scientific and global archaeology, well, by almost the very de definition, has, has global resonance. And I wonder if you could comment on that, whether you think that's the case, and whether you think, how would one encourage other people working in other parts of the world to follow the principles, if you like, of Kuliana? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, um, I think the, the short answer is the same problem that Trey Harrison and the Association of Black Anthropologists were wrestling with in their 1987 session that produced the, the volume is, is again, the, the, the politics of the canon, right? You know, who's getting excited, who's reading what, what, what gets valued in, in curriculums, which is still the ongoing struggle. And, and I was watching a couple of, of the other sessions in the series too, which I, I know this is still, so prominent, right? Um, you know, uh, how do you you break the grip of, of the, that core Western canon and, and allow for these other really productive knowledge systems and practices to enter and be taught and to be used? Um, you know, there, there's a lot more work that's being done broadly, I think, within Indigenous studies. Um, to really make these cases. Um, obviously, Linda Tuhiwai Smith's uh, decolonizing methodologies being critical, but there's a number of other thinkers who have built on that work. And the, it's, 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 it's really grown, at least within the indigenous studies circles. But again, your point is, is so critical. It's like, you know, does it just stay within those circles or, or when and, and how does it come in to departments or who's teaching it and then how does it become foregrounded in in meetings and when when does one again kind of start sponsoring a lot more of these versus other things right um and that's you know i think people are trying to make that progress but you know that bit, that is the, the big challenge i see um because there's quite a lot being written here and others who are in communication in, in the field of indigenous studies are also starting to circulate different concepts, right? You know, like with Maori there, you know, um, Kaupapa Maori whole, whole methodology, right? That uh, Linda Tuhi Weissmith talks about and, and others that are working in, in, in similar areas. Um, so there's small steps, but yeah, the, the canon is still very much the canon and we just gotta keep working on it. Um, thank you, Amelia. Mute. Hi, Ty, lovely to see you. And thanks for a really stimulating talk as ever. Um, I wanted to go back to your idea of radical relationality and some of the conversations that we ha we're having at the Who Are We workshop. 
and ask you um, particularly about this concept of the ally, because when you were talking about some of the movements that you've been part of and your students, you talked about allyship. And in this kind of concept of relationality, what kinds of qualities does a good alliance have? Like, is being an ally just about kind of a kind of, um, I mean, I, I'm asking this as a, I don't believe that it is, but <laughs> is it a kind of a one-way street of just supporting and enabling? Or is there more kind of reciprocity or possibilities for reciprocity and sharing in there? I want to just, to, if you could just expand on your concept of allyship in there. Sure, thanks. Um, and great to see you, Amelia. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 it has to be more than a one-way street if you're looking at what it is to be an, an ally. Um, and again, the term does get complicated when you're looking at a practice like Kuleana, which on the one hand kind of delimits certain areas which you, you do or don't have authority in, and at the same time, it creates those avenues kind of between through these points of relation who, who kind of bridge those, those gaps. Um, so they, they, they afford the, 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 the two way, whether it's reciprocal, I, I'm, I don't know whether that's partly, sometimes get a little bit worried when reciprocity is is just kind of thrown out as, as a sort of kind of equivalence when it's it's really not right there, there's all these kinds of negotiations that happen when when you're looking for what's the best way to reciprocate um and in when in in all matters i think it really comes down to what's what's the core issues that that are gonna connect and 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 tie these 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 communities together whether it's around oral histories or if it's around sacred sites or something else. And, and to, to be clear about these are one of the conditions that are creating these, these relations and, and to be open with what's going on in these, these particular moments. Um, because at other moments, you might not have that. There'll be different sets of kuleana coming in to create different networks and, and different alliances and collaborations. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question really well, but that, that's sort of my thinking on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Please raise your hand or just do it in the chat. Um, Okay, if not, thank you very much, Dr. Tengen, for a very fascinating talk. And uh, uh, thank you for the audience for joining us. And uh, well, please join us next week for our, um, for our next session. Have a nice evening.